Good to see you today. God bless you for being here. You're looking good. I hope you've had a great weekend already. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever gotten to know anybody really incredible? I mean, you just sit back and go, this is an incredible person. Their contribution in life, the qualities of their life, something, some combination of those things just makes them so incredible to you. Well, you know, we've all met some incredible people. Uh, you know, I met Johnny Cash one time. Is that not an incredible deal? I shook hands with Johnny Cash, but I didn't get to know him. I mean, I just met him. And then I met Billy Graham one time. That was an unforgettable moment. And it was a Wednesday that I met him. I met him at lunch on Wednesday. It wasn't just he and I, don't get me wrong, but uh, we were at a great big event, and I met Billy Graham, and it was a Wednesday, so I had to preach that night, and I told the people at church, I said, that's the hand of the hand that shook the hand of the man right there. But uh, I didn't really get to know him. I just met him. But if I had to tell you the most incredible person that I've ever met and really gotten to know, it would be Dr. David Sacker in New York City. As you, some of you know, Tina uh, had some medical needs several years ago. We went up to Houston, where some of the best specialists in the country work, and we met with a guy there, and he said, look, he said, you need to get your wife to New York City to Mount Sinai Hospital, and you need to get with Dr. David Sacker. He's the best in the country. Well, by God's grace and a great story, I'll not tell you all the details, we were able to get in to see Dr. Sacker. We really knew nothing about him other than the specialists in Houston told us to get to New York City, get to Mount Sinai, and get with Dr. Sacker. But as I got to know him, I thought, what a great person. And the more we got to know about him, the more impressed we were with him, not only as a doctor and our doctor, her doctor, but just as a person of his contribution. You know, his father was the founding president of Brandeis University, and his brother was one of the leading psychiatrists in the United States. His other brother is probably the 20th century's leading expert on the history of Israel. Dr. Sacker himself had graduated with honors from Harvard and then Harvard Medical School, and after he had finished his medical training, he and a group of other young researchers went with the U.S. Public Health Service to Bangladesh, where they developed the first successful oral rehydration therapy for cholera, which has gone on and is known to have saved the lives of millions of people every year. Can you imagine living your life knowing that something you did as a fairly young person has literally saved the life of millions of people? Even one person would be a miracle. And yet, millions of people every year and this was this doctor that we got to know, and what an incredible person in dealing with him on a regular basis. If Tina were standing with me right this minute, and I think she's watching the live stream right now, but if she were standing here right with me, she would tell you this is the most incredible person that either of us has ever known personally, his contributions and all of that. He's incredible. He's really a great person. Maybe you've known somebody like that who you just kind of stand in awe of their contributions and what they've done and, and the way they live their life. Well, if you took all of the people you've ever met or known that have been absolutely incredible, and if we took every person all collectively, how many of you know that all of them together will never equal Jesus Christ? He's the most incredible person who's ever lived. And, and here's the incredible thing about Jesus. Not only was he incredible 2,000 years ago, he's incredible today. He, he not only did something incredible when he died on the cross to give you and me eternal life, but how many of you know that even if you've been walking with him for five years or 20 years or 35 years, Jesus will still help you today in incredible ways. 
He's the most incredible person that has ever lived. And that's why today I want to talk about the incredible Jesus. Would you open your Bibles with me, please, to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, a passage of Scripture you're probably pretty familiar with. And I want you to open up your Bibles and look at John chapter 2, verse 1, as we look together at the incredible Jesus. The Bible says, On the third day, <clears throat> there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. In other words, the real purpose of his life, which we come to find out later in the book of John, was the cross and the resurrection. That was his purpose. That was the hour for which he had come. The significant moment in the life of Jesus was his cross and his resurrection. And here, the mother of Jesus is coming to him with, you know, an aggravating issue, a problem that, uh, you know, is embarrassing, but it's not really on par with healing a leper or raising the dead or going to the cross for all mankind. They're out of wine at a wedding. And Jesus said, look, that's not my problem. But she'd been dealing with Jesus a long time. She knew him really well. And even when Jesus showed this initial reluctance, she turned to the servants in verse 5, look at it, and his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it, and when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone who serves the good wine First, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. How many of you know the bridegroom is thinking to himself, what are you talking about? The bridegroom had no clue. Uh, and uh, obviously the master of the feast, the most important leader there, he didn't know where this had come from either. So they're congratulating each other, but neither one of them knew the real miracle that had taken place. But look at verse 11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. There's just something about Jesus of Nazareth and his ability to meet the needs of every single person that makes him the most incredible person who's ever lived. Michael Green, the former special assistant to the Archbishop of Canterbury, once said, and I quote, if you're looking for perfection, you would need to look no further. The life of Jesus shines out as the ideal for all humanity. Now, all of us are probably pretty familiar with the story that we have just read. Uh, and... Uh, the problem of the day was that they were out of wine at a public festival. But I want to ask you a question today. What's missing in your life today? Where's the shortage, the lack, the insufficiency in your world? What challenges or difficulties or problems are you dealing with today? Because if you and I look at this story as some kind of doctrine of wine, we've missed the point altogether. This is a story about a problem in everyday life. This isn't the healing of uh, a, a leper. This isn't the causing of a person who's blind to suddenly see. This isn't a miracle of walking on water, or raising the dead, or going to the cross to save all mankind. This is an everyday problem. Somebody should have planned for the size of this party a little better. Somebody should have predicted how many guests were there and how much wine they would have consumed. 
For some reason, they had an everyday, nagging, aggravating dilemma on their hands. Not exactly major, earth-shattering issues. And yet, Jesus performed his first miracle, not to provide sight to the blind or clean skin to the leper or raising the dead back to life, but just meeting the need of an everyday problem that people have to deal with. So here's my question. If you look at this story and you substitute the absence of wine from a public festival with your issue that you're dealing with, Maybe it is financial. Maybe there's a, a struggle in your business or with your uh, health, or maybe it's something your kids are going through, or maybe you've been at a crossroads with a decision you're trying to make, and you're wrestling with that decision. Here's my question. What keeps you up at night? Well, that's the kind of stuff Jesus is willing to meet and deal with in your life, and the incredible takes place where problems are present. Miracles never happen in problem-free zones. Miracles only happen where there are problems. So if you've got a problem today of any kind, description, or dimension, let me just encourage you, your problem is not your problem, because your problem is the pathway to an incredible move of God. Because God does not move in incredible ways where there are no problems. So when we look at this familiar story of struggle and challenge and difficulty, again, an average, everyday problem, not the big world-changing stuff, but just the aggravating stuff of the moment, how can you and I expect God to move in our world, in our experience, when we have life's everyday aggravations. Well, let me share this principle with you. Jesus accomplishes the incredible when we surrender to his plan. You say, what are you talking about? Well, look at this passage of Scripture. Again, you see this commonality about this story. There's a wedding. Nothing, you know, there's not a convocation of the great religious leaders of the day. It was a wedding, something that people would have just gone to that they had been to many, many before. And it was in Cana of Galilee. We don't even know where that is, you know? If I took you to the Holy Land today, I'll take you to Cana, but it's not biblical Cana. We're almost certain that it's not biblical Cana. It's just a town named Cana today. We don't really know where Cana was. But this much we do know, it was in Galilee. And the people of Galilee were regular people, for the most part, poor people, farmers, craftsmen, tradesmen. Their life expectancy was short. The average life expectancy of a man in the Roman Empire at the time of Jesus was 40. How'd you like to get to be 40 and think you're old? Some of you think that's old, but praise God. <laughs> you won't feel that way someday. But their life was hard. They didn't have good health care. They didn't have social programs to fall back on when things were tough. Their, their life was hard work and, 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 and problems that we can hardly even imagine because our lives are so much more beneficial and so much more easy today. And so, in a lot of ways, a wedding was a break from the mundane and the difficult and the ordinary, and it was a time to rejoice with family and friends and enjoy what was normally a, a tough life. And a wedding could go on for a week or maybe two weeks, and there were presents exchanged, and there was music, and there was, you know, all kinds of dancing, and just families getting together and enjoying each other's company. And the bridegroom's family was responsible for providing plenty of food and plenty of wine for the festivity. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, was at this party, and it looks like she was in charge because the bridegroom didn't know there was a lack of wine. He didn't clue into that. And uh, the master of the ceremony, he didn't realize there was a lack of wine. He thought the bridegroom had plenty. 
But Mary seems to be the one in charge. Because when later on in verse 5, when she talks to the servants, she's given them instructions and they are obeying. They are doing what she says. How many of you ladies know that it is obvious that somebody left it to a lady to be in charge of all that? Huh? How many of you know that's probably the way it was? Well, it looks like Mary was in charge. Was Mary the one who had miscalculated the wine? I don't know. I'm not throwing Mary under the bus. I'm just raising a legitimate question. I don't know for sure. I do know this. When she went to Jesus and said, there's no wine, I can almost anticipate that there was a note of anxiety in the tone of her voice. But not for Jesus. He said, what's that got to do with me? My hour has not come. In other words, do you not know, Mom, I have come here for a much bigger purpose than serving as a mixologist. <laughs> right? That's not my reason for being here. And yet she knew him really well. And she told the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. Now, you and I can't manipulate God. How many of you have learned that principle? Amen? God doesn't provide us a string that we pull and he does what we want him to do. But here's what I have learned in a few years of serving him, that he has provided us some principles that if we will follow these principles, they are generally good guidelines for understanding how we can experience God's very best in our life. And how many of you know that we come here today not just for what's good on Sunday, but we come here today to get some stuff that will work on Monday morning as well as Sunday morning? In fact, I read this week, if what you're talking about on Sunday morning doesn't work on Monday morning, you're not talking about the right stuff on Sunday morning. So what they were dealing with in John chapter 2 was a Monday morning problem, a real aggravation, a true-to-life dilemma. Maybe not on par with the big stuff you have to deal with, but it was one of those things that every single person has to deal with. In this case, it could have been a real embarrassment, maybe an embarrassment for Mary herself, but she knew what to do, and she came to Jesus. And, and, and the whole principle here is if you want to learn to receive, if you want to get God's very best, if you want to get Jesus involved in your personal issues, learn the principle of surrender to the Lordship of Christ. The first area that we notice uh, is she was willing to ask. How many of you know that asking is, in a sense, a surrender? Asking is an acknowledgment. It's an acknowledgment that I can't do it. I've got to get some help. I need somebody to help me. Now, while there's not a question mark after her statement, it's clear that she's going to Jesus with a request. The implication is obvious. They have no wine. Jesus even asked, what's this got to do with me? You see, there is an, there is an implied request here. Lord, do something about this. The first principle, ladies and gentlemen, of surrender is a willingness to ask God to get involved in your stuff. A willingness to say, Lord, I need your help. Lord, will you help me? I love the fact that, you know, when we ask, we're really saying, I can't do it, but I know who can. There's a power in asking. And Mary was not afraid to ask Jesus to do something incredible. Asking is really a sign of faith. Part of surrender is a willingness to ask. You know, several years ago, I, I had a brief but powerful relationship with Adrian Rogers. I had respected him for many, many years and had looked up to him. And after I came to Hyde Park, I got to know him. And one day, about 15 years ago, I wanted to talk to him about something, so I gave him a call. I was sitting upstairs in my office, and I gave him a call, and we were talking about whatever it was. And in the middle of our conversation, Adrian Rogers, who some of you know who I'm talking about, is one of the greatest Christians of the 20th century. We're talking about whatever it was, and he said, he said, Kai, why don't you come to Memphis? He said, why don't you fly out here and let's spend a day. He said, we'll go in my study. We'll talk about preaching and, and pastoring our churches. Now, for some of you, the idea of talking about preaching all day sounds like a trip to the dentist, but 
for me to sit with Adrian Rogers and talk about preaching and pastoring, I mean, that was like a dream come true. And here is, I'm talking to Adrian Rogers, and he's like, Kai, why don't you fly out to Memphis and let's spend a day and we'll talk, we'll go in my study and we'll talk about preaching. And, and, and I said, man, that sounds great. But I didn't write down a date and we didn't get anything on the calendar. And like a lot of other opportunities that have come and gone in life, I thought to myself, you know, one of these days, that's going to be something I want to do. But not too long after that, Dr. Rogers announced his retirement. He retired and then he was diagnosed with a fast-acting cancer and died just a very short time after he left the pastorate. And I've thought to myself so many times, why did I not go to Memphis? You know, was it one of those things where, well, my kids were busy and there was lots going on at the church, and I just thought, well, one of these times when things get a little easier and slow down a little bit, when things get a little more convenient, I'm going to act on that and what might I have learned that day? What would I have walked away with that day if I'd have spent a day with one of the greatest Christian leaders that we've ever known? Well, I don't know, because it was a missed opportunity. The only reason I bring that up is to say this. Everyone in this room is dealing with something. You're dealing with issues and challenges and problems. Some of them are great and huge, and some of them are just daily aggravations. But we have a heavenly Father who has invited us to sit down with him and fellowship with uh, all the problems we've got. God Almighty has said to you and me, why don't we sit down and talk about what you're dealing with and let me speak into your life some solutions and some answers just like Adrian Rogers invited me to Memphis and I never acted on that opportunity, all week long God has been saying to you and me, why don't you take some time, shut the door, turn off the distractions, and let's talk about what's going on in your life. And I want to ask you a serious question. Has God been inviting you to spend some time with him in prayer and fellowship this week? And has that been a missed opportunity? Ah, maybe I'm talking to the Quarries Church. Maybe I don't even need to talk to you about this. Maybe this was the 830 service that needed to hear this message. Part of surrender is a willingness to say, Lord, I am tired of laying awake at night worrying about this on my own. I'm tired of trying to figure it out on my own. I'm tired of turning to people around me who either don't know or don't care enough to help me. But you've been asking me to come in and talk to you about it. I have the privilege of prayer. Is that an opportunity you are taking advantage of? Yes or no? And then notice, there's not only just the power of asking, there's just... And this sounds like an oxymoron. It's, it sounds like the opposite would be true. There's power in surrender. I mean, that sounds like the opposite of what we think. We would think there's power in aggression. There's power in force. There's power in pushing forward. But when it comes to the Lordship of Christ, our greatest power is giving up and giving in. You say, where are you getting that? It's in the Bible, verse 5. After Jesus said, what's this got to do with me? Mary turns to the servants and said in verse 5, do whatever he tells you to do. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Craig Groeschel said, you can have control or you can have faith, but you can't have both. <laughs> Let me say it again because you didn't even want to believe it. You can have control or you can have faith, but you can't have both. There's so much power available to us if we'll stop trying to do it in our own strength. There wasn't a liquor store open for a beer run for the party. There was not a human being 
that was going to help them in the dilemma that they faced that day in little dusty Cana of Galilee. Mary, or somebody close to her, was on the verge of embarrassment, and she knew one person only on the invitation list who could do something about the problem she faced. And she said, Jesus, we need your help. And then she turned to a group of servants who were apparently waiting for her instructions and said, whatever he says, you do. And you know what I like about that? She didn't know what he was going to do. She had no clue. Unlike some of us, come on, she didn't tell Jesus how to fix the problem. Amen? Her prayer life was not an advice situation. She was not in an, an advisory capacity. Some of us think we're running for assistant God, you know? <clears throat> and when we pray, we're telling God, okay, here's the problem. Now, Lord, here's the five steps I recommend you take to solve the problem. She didn't know what Jesus was going to do. You say, how do you know? Well, look what she said to the servants. Whatever he says, do it. You see, she had learned through about 30 years of practice around Jesus that when Jesus gets involved in the problems of our life, he has a way of bringing to bear some solutions that would have never crossed our mind because we can do what we can do, but Jesus can do what God can do. And, and, and so she gave, she gave those servants this counsel, whatever he tells you to do. So if you're in a situation... And maybe I'm talking to the wrong people. You tell me. If you're in a situation where you don't know what to do or how to do it, take a mother's advice and do whatever he tells you to do. That's surrender. That, that says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey. I'm going to do it his way. And, 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 and in so many ways for us, we've been trained to think differently than that. I was in Colorado Springs doing ministry a little while back, and the pastor of the church and I were headed to a, to a craft show that uh, one Sunday afternoon. Now, let me share something with you. I have nothing against craft shows and an equal amount of no interest in craft shows, okay? I, I, I'm not against them, and I have no interest in them. Now, I'm, you know, if you do, praise God. You know, everybody's got to have a hobby, right? Or maybe it's your vocation. I'm, I'm all for you. I'm just not personally all that motivated by craft shows. And you say, then why did you go? Because there were a lot of people at this thing down the street from the church, and we want to go do some ministry, and that's where the people were. So we went to the craft show. So he and I split up. The pastor was going one way and I was going another. And we were just talking to people, trying to hope that we would get into some good conversations. And I started talking with a young man. He was probably about 10 years older than me. And, uh, you know, I started talking with him. He was a vendor at one of the craft uh, displays. And somehow we got, you know, the conversation started rolling. And, and he made this statement. He said, you know, I'd really like to know God's will for my life. So I'm like signaling the pastor, like, whatever you got going on, drop it and come on over here. Because I got a live one here. This guy, <laughs> this is what we've been looking for, right? So the pastor came over and we were talking to the guy about knowing the will of God. And then we, all three of us went over and we were sitting down getting some coffee and we were having this conversation, and so the pastor and I both were trying to share some scripture and weave some counsel in to the conversation, but have you ever been with somebody that, you know, they say they want to do what God wants them to do, but the more scripture you give them, the more they go the other direction. I mean, this guy was dodging and weaving and, and uh, playing rope-a-dope with us while we were trying to share with him, and, and I was young and ab abrupt at the time, and I said, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, if you were to discover the will of God, would you be willing to do it? And he thought for many, he said, no, probably not. 
And I think that sometimes when we talk about surrendering to the Lordship of Christ and knowing what God wants us to do, some of us have concluded that what we really want is to understand the doctrine of the Lordship of Christ, not to do the Lordship of Christ in our life or what God really wants us to do. Am I talking to anybody besides myself? In fact, let me just drill down on that a little bit. How many of you have ever uh, dealt with a problem for longer than a little while and maybe you've been asking God, maybe, maybe what you're dealing with right now, and maybe I'm just preaching to me. And that's okay, too, because I need to hear it. But if while I'm preaching to me, some of this rubs off on you, go ahead and take it up. How many, time, how many times have you asked God to meet that need you got in your life? I'm like, is this a new problem or is this something that's been around for a while that you're dealing with right now? Like, if I were to ask you, what's the biggest handicapping problem in your life right now? What is the thing you're dealing with, the most aggravating? And you say, oh, I know what that is. Well, how long have you been dealing with that? You say, well, for a while. Well, when's the last time you asked God to do something about it? Well, you say, I keep asking him to do something about it. Well, let me ask you this. What has he told you? He's not going to change his mind. He, you know, I think sometimes we say, God, I got this problem. I don't know what to do about it. Lord, what should I do? And the Lord speaks into our life something that we're to do. And we say, Lord, let's keep talking about it. (laughs) Like maybe if we, if we talk to him enough, you know, how many of you have been parents and after a while, sometimes your kids just wear you down, you know? Say, look, look, there's traffic, you know, you want to run in it. What can I? No, 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 no. I got to keep reminding myself this is an election season. Everybody's pretty. I'm... Maybe it's more like that guy. You know the guy that was on the diet, you know? And uh, every day on the way to work, he passed by that donut shop. And, you know, it was temptation, man because he's on a diet. And he passed by that donut shop one day, and I'm telling you, everything in him said, I want a donut. And he he wanted a donut so bad, he got to thinking, you know, I believe the Lord is leading me to get a donut. (laughs) But he really wanted to pray about it, you know, and he said, Lord, Lord, I, I feel like, yeah, I'm on a diet. I made a commitment, but Lord, if you want me to have a donut, I'm going to lay a fleece before you, Lord. If you want me to have a donut, here's how I'll know. If I find a parking space in front of that donut shop, and there's never a parking space in front, but if I find a parking space in front of that donut shop, I'll know it's your will. And sure enough, on the 12th time around, he found an open spot. (laughs) Some of us approach the will of God like that, like if I circle God enough, and if I just keep asking him long enough, and 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 maybe I'll word it in a different way, that somehow God will just somehow concede and change his mind. And let me tell you something. It doesn't work that way, child of God. The Lord is either Lord of all or not Lord at all. You can't be a little bit Lord. And child of God, if you've been talking to the Lord about something in your life, it's not about theory. It's about response. What does he want you to do? Then do it. Do it. And here's the issue. You say, well, I'm just tired of having problems. Well, problems are part of life. But here's the good news. This whole story changed. The first five verses of this story are all about the problem. And the second section of this story from verse 6 through 11 is about the incredible solution. Everything changed. And that means, ladies and gentlemen, listen, when you and I come to God with problems and difficulties, whatever they are, no matter how big or small, and we are willing to be transformed by His counsel, we're willing to surrender our agenda and our, you know, plans for His plans, our problems become solutions. Our troubles become testimonies. Our mess becomes our message. 
our insufficiency becomes our abundance. When we come to the place and say, Lord, I'm bringing all this today to you. 